And now our final speaker of this evening, and I know you'll all be happy that you are here to share this with us tonight. General John Allen is retired United States Marine Corps General, former commander of the International Security Assistance Force and US Forces Afghanistan. Most recently, he served as the former special presidential envoy for the Global Coalition to Counter ISIL. He's here tonight straight from a conference working with Eastern European countries on the continuing battle against terrorist extremists. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming General John Allen. Thank you for being here tonight. Honor to be with you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please, uh, please be seated. Well, first, let me congratulate Letitia on an incredible effort. Uh, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Having seen her in action, we need to tap some of that energy. Uh, and Mike Broomhead, uh, thank you for what you have done tonight to keep this show together. This, this is a very important evening. Your narration. Your encouragement uh, has been very important to the evening, and I want to also honor your sacrifice and the sacrifice of your family as well. <laughs> Two great soldiers in the audience that I was able to see tonight that I really have great affection for, General Spider Marks, an old, a dear friend uh, and a great soldier, but also uh, Colonel Greg Gadsden. Uh, Colonel Greg Gadsden, of course, was the commanding officer of a place called Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Uh, and as the commander, uh, while I was deployed uh, in Afghanistan, he took care of my family, who I left behind. Greg, thank you very much for looking after them. And of course, of course, I want to speak to all the Medal of Honor recipients and tell you how deeply we are inspired by you this evening, to our World War II veterans, how you have maintained our freedom for so many years, sustained us during times of darkness by watching your courage and by living in the shadow of all that you have done for us, the greatest generation. And the veterans here tonight, thank you for bearing the burden of continued service to our country and keeping us free. So, thank you. I want to thank the Institute this evening, not just for the, the invitation to speak, but also for the incredible work that you're doing with respect to the civics education and the initiative that we've talked about so many times this evening. And I, I can tell you from personal experience, uh, in combat, when you ask a soldier or a Marine to rise up off the ground and move forward into enemy fire, something they have to believe in is their country. And having a sense of the civics, having a sense of the government, having a sense of who we are, and it's this morning we talked about it, America isn't a place. America isn't a symbol. America is an idea. It is an idea, and it is sustained as an idea by those of us who not only have worn the uniform, but all the patriots in this room who believe in the idea of America and are willing to sacrifice every single day for it. And we will not sustain that idea unless we understand who we are as a nation, unless we understand our history, unless we understand the functioning of our government, and that is why this initiative is so important. That is why this institute is so important. And thank you so much for the work that you have done. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in, in a world of crisis and conflict, there's a lot of grist for dinner speakers. Tonight, though, I, I don't want to talk about politics, and I don't want to talk about policy. The Middle East is more unstable and troubled than I have seen it in all the decades that I've personally served there, which for me is about 25 years total. The region is now aflame, and the potential outcomes, we've seen it coming, expanding Muslim extremism, deepening sectarianism, and the inundation of Europe beneath a tsunami of refugees. Indeed. These are collectively unthinkable outcomes emerging from that region. We're also facing the fundamental change in the social fabric of Europe. The EU teeters on the edge of irrelevance, 
or perhaps even complete failure. As beleaguered societies in Europe, and I was just with them yesterday, desperately seek to cope with the influx of refugees in numbers not seen since the end of World War II, which has the great potential of challenging the European societies upon which so much of this nation is founded. Russia is resurgent, and in China's rising, East Asia brings many unresolved difficulties. So there's plenty of talk to talk about this evening, but what I want to do, especially with this august and honorable gathering, is to speak about commitment and courage and fidelity and intrepidity, words that are familiar to many of you here this evening. So rather than a speech about policy, I want to tell you a personal story that is germane to all in this gathering this evening. It represents in a period of uncertainty, in a period where we have seen the world not for a very long time in so much trouble, the one certainty that gives us hope, the one certainty that America will persevere, and that is the certainty of the magnificence of our troops. It was uh, well after midnight in Kabul when my military assistant and I settled into the operations center of my special operations element in Afghanistan. Several days before, a young American doctor, Dr. Dilip Joseph, had been kidnapped by the Taliban when he and several other Afghans were going about their work on a Christian mission, Morning Star Development. Now, any time an American or a citizen of any of our coalition countries was kidnapped, we did our very best to seek their release. With our significant intelligence resources, we would immediately begin tracking the hostage and the captors. And in this case, we knew Dr. Joseph was now alone. He was in Taliban hands in a very remote area of Afghanistan. We also knew that there was a team of Taliban coming from Pakistan to take charge of the doctor and return him to Pakistan for whatever purposes we had yet to learn. But that development was not good. And while I often would let these situations play out just a bit to see if the Taliban might release their hostage for a variety of reasons, we were now out of time. 24 to 26 hours from now, Dr. Joseph would be en route to Pakistan under Taliban escort. So I ordered my Special Operations Command to immediately launch a rescue mission to recover this American. And as I settled into the, the center seat of the operations center, on the far wall, I surveyed the large TV screens. And with the exception of one screen, which I'll describe later, each carried the images of various special operations underway at that very moment across Afghanistan. Each singled a unique drama unfolding in the shadow war that we were waging relentlessly against Al-Qaeda and against the Taliban. Within a few minutes, my eyes focused on the top left screen, displaying a sharp but gray shaded image from one of our Predator drones. It was in a high orbit over the remote mountain location where Dr. Dillip Joseph was being held. It was early December, and already it was very cold in Afghanistan, very cold in the Logman province. Some of you here tonight may have even served in that province, and you know how remote it is and how difficult the terrain is in that region. A special operations watch officer began to brief me on how the mission was unfolding and what I was seeing on the screen. One of my SEAL strike forces had been inserted by a helicopter into this very difficult terrain hours before, and they were making their final movement onto the objective which was a small, remote compound with several low buildings. And I was now directly monitoring the communications of the SEALs as they began to set security around the objective area and to move into their final assault positions. As I watched the mission unfolding, I reflected on the fact that our special operators were conducting similar missions across Afghanistan right that moment. This one, though, this one was different. 
Rather than being a capture or kill mission, this was a raid to recover and to rescue an American citizen. And we were approaching the moment of the final assault, the movement into action. On the sea screen, the seals were clearly visible, arrayed around and now on the objective. It was completely dark, and the Taliban who had posted no outside security were evidently asleep, confident that the remoteness of this site, the mountain vastness and the cold of Afghanistan were protection enough from the long reach of American special operators. And in those moments, I tried to imagine the despair Dr. Joseph must have felt, so alone, so distant in that mud hut, smarting from the beatings we had seen the Taliban administer him the day before. The Taliban were wrong, of course, in their arrogance to believe that they were secure, and American SEALs were about to prove it to them. On the screen, the SEALs began to line up, to stack, as we call it, next to the door of the building where we believed Dr. Joseph was being held. It would only be seconds now. The assault unfolded like a bolt of lightning, as SEALs do what they do best, dealing with the enemy at close quarters. I watched. We all watched silently as the images of the SEALs poured into the building. Having ordered this mission personally, these seconds had my full and rapt attention. Then the report. The, hostages, the hostage was recovered unhurt, and all of the Taliban were dead. But a SEAL was down. Shot in the head as the SEALs had rushed inside the building. The sense of relief that we had that Dr. Joseph was now in our hands, largely unharmed, was now replaced by the urgency of getting our precious young SEAL casualty to medical care. We quickly reported back to the United States, and I reported back to NATO the successful recovery of Dr. Joseph. But back on the objective, the SEALs brought their extraction birds, the large Chinook helicopters, right in next to the objective. Time was of the essence now, with the area still in complete darkness our special operators moving under their night vision devices and an infrared strobe light blinking brightly under NVG light indicated where the pilots would land. This began a race against time as the strike force and the pilots sought to get their grievously wounded shipmate to our level three neurotrauma center at the sprawling air base in Bagram. Numb, from the fatigue of the days of high tempo operations prior to this and the events that had just unfolded, I got up to leave the operations center for some fresh air in the cold, cobble night. And you'll remember I, I mentioned that there was one screen that was not on a mission channel that evening. It carried a very different mission unfolding that same time, indeed at exactly that same moment in the United States. The volume had been muted the entire time I'd been in the room. And there on the screen, just below where the drama of Dr. Joseph's rescue had played out, was the iconic Army-Navy football game. And I was nearly overwhelmed by the irony. Both the Army and the Navy and Marines see a large number of their special operators emerging from their respective service academies, West Point and Annapolis. And a number of my SEALs and my Army special operators in Afghanistan that very moment had played in that same game only a few short years before. On the one screen, life and death were playing out before our very eyes. And on the other, young warriors, cadets and midshipmen, struggled on the gridiron as they prepared themselves for an uncertain future. What immediately came to my mind certainly was the timeless observation of one of America's greatest soldiers, Douglas MacArthur, who once observed of these athletic matches that, quote, on the fields of friendly strife are sown the seeds that on other days and on other fields will bear the fruits of victory. Well, that's exactly what had just happened in the Logman Mountains. And what was happening every day and every night across Afghanistan, the seeds of victory, were now being harvested. 
I remained in the Ops Center that morning receiving reports about the condition of our young SEAL. He'd made it alive to Bagram, but had succumbed shortly after of the grievous head wound that he'd received. And as I walked back to my billet, remembering that the sun was reddening the sky over the Hindu Kush, I truly felt the burden of the realization that this decision to rescue Dr. Joseph had resulted in the death of this magnificent young warrior. And that morning was truly prayerful for me. A couple of days later, my special operators held a traditional ramp ceremony at the Bagram Air Base where Petty Officer First Class Nicholas Checky would be sent home. For those of you who are not familiar with this term, the ramp ceremony was the formal ceremony where we would solemnly carry the remains of our fallen into the hold of a cargo plane for the long, final journey home to a grieving family. That part of Bagram, that part of the base used by our special operators for their ramp ceremonies was very dark. And I brought my two UH-60 Black Hawk helicopters in to land my command team and me from Kabul very close to the location. I met the commanders of the raid. I met the leaders and the members of the SEAL strike force who'd conducted the mission. And then I was introduced to someone I had not anticipated seeing that night, <clears throat> Dr. Joseph. It's difficult to put into words how I perceived him and his attitude at that moment, but I came away from the brief meeting in the dark in Bagram, believing with all my heart that rescuing Dilip Joseph, we had saved not just an American citizen, we'd saved a very good man. And I have to this very moment the utmost respect for him as a doctor and as a Christian. As I watched him move in and among the SEALs who'd risked their lives to save him. Soon enough, it was time to put Petty Officer Checky on the aircraft. Fellow SEALs, Checky's swim buddies, as they call themselves from the strike force, lifted on their shoulders, their powerful, strong shoulders, the transfer case, now draped with the stars and the stripes containing the remains of their comrade. On order, but in silence and in step, we all slowly marched up the back ramp of the C-17, this enormous American transport aircraft, and we placed Petty Officer Checky on the deck in the center of this cavernous cargo aircraft. And the starkness of this sight, providing even greater poignance to the enormity of our loss. With tenderness, you can only understand when you witness it. The SEALs gently placed the transfer case on the metal deck and slowly, solemnly saluted the flag and their shipmate and quietly departed the aircraft from the front hatch. Then in succession, each of us knelt at the side of the coffin for our moment of prayer and respect. And as I always did, I placed my hand on the blue field of the flag and gently rubbed the, claw the cloth. With my head bowed, I said a prayer that I had now recite, recited over hundreds of coffins by this point in my command. And finally, I placed my command coin on the first white stripe below the blue field where I had countless before and standing, rendered a final salute and made my way off the aircraft. Back in the cold darkness of the runway, I sought out the special operations commander and we conducted a few minutes of business just meters off the back ramp of the C-17. And finally, it was time to go. And as I looked back up towards the C-17, I saw a sight I will never forget. For there, standing on the ramp of that aircraft, framed against the brilliant light from inside the cargo bay, was Dr. Joseph, surrounded by the SEALs who had rescued him. Some were kneeling alongside him. Some were on a knee looking up at him. But to each, he was expressing himself in the most heartfelt way, his thanks for what they had done for him and his sincere and utmost condolences for the loss of Petty Officer Checky. And beyond them, in the hold of the aircraft, was the solitary flag-draped coffin of Nicholas Checky, ready for his final trip home. 
It remains one of the most powerful and enduring memories for me of the 33 months that I spent in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. And finally, you would want to know this, that the next day we found that Taliban team coming from Pakistan to retrieve Dr. Joseph, and we killed them with an airstrike. Now, there's an interesting PS to this story, an interesting postscript, a recent development. For one of the SEALs on that mission who'd been on the assault force, that had actually entered the hut, in fact, the number two in the stack, to save Dr. Joseph was Senior Chief Edward C. Byers, who last month just received the Medal of Honor for his actions that night. For in the close quarters battle that raged only seconds, Senior Chief Byers shielded Dr. Joseph's body with his own while restraining another Taliban who was trying to kill the doctor for another seal to finish off. It is the first active duty Medal of Honor presented to a living U.S. Navy recipient since 1976. Tonight because, tonight because of who this organization is and who are with us, I wanted to offer this one story of, countless stories, of the countless stories of selfless sacrifice that has defined our troops for going on 15 straight years of combat but to find our veterans across this great land for all that they have done individually and collectively to keep us free. You see, ladies and gentlemen, over this time, we have fought two major conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, and now in Iraq again. We've maintained a decisive presence in the Arabian Gulf and in East Asia, and we've done it 24-7, and all of this has been born, all of it on the strong, broad shoulders of our young men and women in uniform, who, my dear friends, number less than 1% of the population of the United States. Less than 1%. It is they who have kept the wolf from the door. It is they who have stared abject evil Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and now ISIL, stared it in the face and fought it for our security. And it is they who've guarded us while we slept, while they've conducted operations in a hundred places we've never heard of. And they're doing it tonight, right now, as we dine together in honor of them. These youngsters, like Nicholas Checky and Senior Chief Byers, are the modern version of what Thomas Brokaw would once call the greatest generation. I've seen them at their best. I've seen them in the fight. They are lions in action, but they are compassionate to the weak and they are protective of the defenseless. They represent the very best of our people and the very best of our society. So in closing, I'd like to ask you to take a trip to a distant place and Letitia, Letitia mentioned it a few moments ago and it's far from Arizona distant in miles, but it's also distant from the politics of government and the ideas of sequester and the gridlock we face today and the rhetoric of the election campaign. It's a place of significance. It's a place of nobility, for here our heroes lie. Section 60 at Arlington National Cemetery. In that very small plot of hallowed ground, you will find the entire sweep of the American sacrifice for freedom. There are the graves of our old veterans and their spouses in the waning days of the greatest generation, and we honor their sacrifices. There you will also find the graves of our Korean and Vietnam War heroes who fought wars which in the first instance were largely forgotten, and in the second were largely unrecognized, and they too we honor for their peerless service in often the most unforgiving circumstances and the most thankless of environments. And then you will find, row upon row, the fresh graves. Our newly fallen, our precious children who've died for us in more than a decade of war and combat. In my last pilgrimage to Section 60, I found a funeral underway with a young family now fatherless. 
startled by three volleys of 21 rifle shots, and then overwhelmed by a young army officer who knelt before a brave young widow and her children to offer his condolences and those of a grateful nation and to present her our precious stars and stripes. I saw a young soldier in his camouflage uniform, kneeling next to a grave, a battle buddy, fallen in a distant war, his face in his hands, weeping inconsolably. And I saw a family taping happy birthday balloons to the headstone of their child's grave and holding each other in their grief. Words fail me as I try to explain my emotions at times like these. But Lawrence Binion, in his magnificent poem, For the Fallen, captured the purity of this place and of the human sacrifice and the gift to each of us and to America of this last full measure of devotion. And he would write, they shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. So ladies and gentlemen, please take a moment someday and travel to that distant place. The occupants of that ground gave everything to this country and they now rest beyond the realities of the physical world. From all across this great land, these youngsters joined the service with the certainty that they would fight. And undeterred by that reality, on they came by the thousands from every walk of life and every race and every creed and, yes, from every faith. And they joined for us, they fought for us, they were wounded for us, and they died for us. And I pray so fervently that we have kept faith with them and that we are as a people and that we are as a country worthy of this noblest of gifts that they have given to us. And I believe that nights like this and gatherings like these prove that we have. So let me end with one of the most poignant wartime poems of all times in Flanders Field. And we should contemplate these lines. We should think about them tonight as we do ponder our policy and as we do ponder our campaign rhetoric and as we continue to deal with one apparently intractable crisis after another. And we should all remember, we should all remember that the pole star of certainty in this very uncertain time for America are our magnificent American troops. And Lieutenant Colonel McRae would write, in Flanders fields, the poppies blow. Between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard among the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived. We felt dawn, saw sunset glow. We loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders field. So take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Field. May God bless you, and may God bless your precious families. May God bless this gathering and the Joe Foss Institute, and may God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.